I've been to Canada many times since I first got involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict in June 1982. And I have to say that the place has changed a lot. Uh, when I first came here, Canada was known throughout the world as the model of civility, low-keyedness, uh, just decency. I think it was, um, there was a quality of life index that each year some UN organization uh, issues. And Canada is all, used to always be ranked number one in the world, the place that's most desirable to live. And then it was very hard for me to adjust to the fact that somehow it was like the invasion of the body snatchers. This new government came to power, a fellow named Harper. <laughs> and something really weird happened. And I can't really yet adjust to that reality. I still think of in Canada under Mr. Trudeau. But I know that maybe it was something in the water supply, I don't know. <laughs> but it's a different place. Still, the people are very nice, I think. Uh, well, some of them must have voted for that government, maybe in those remote provinces. <laughs> Actually, one funny story, I don't have time for it now, but I was on a CDC program many years ago, and I was told, I asked, should I interject or should I just patiently wait my turn? And the moderator said, no, you should interject, be aggressive. <laughs> well. At the end of the program, I won't go through the scenario, but I asked her, how was I? And she looked at me mortified, and she said, you were horrible. <laughs> I said, what did I do wrong? And she said, you were so aggressive. <laughs> and I thought to myself, never tell someone from Brooklyn, New York to be aggressive. <laughs> not in Canada. <laughs> you evidently have different standards of aggressiveness, or did, before that government came to power. And then I did as a New Yorker. Uh, I'll be speaking this evening on several topics. I'm trying to figure out where we are now and where we're headed. It's not my nature to speculate on where things are going because you always look very foolish if you make predictions and the predictions turn out not to be correct. So for reasons of ego, if nothing else, I tend to shy away from predictions but I do think, and I hope I'm wrong, I do think we're now headed in an extremely ominous direction and that we may be on the verge or catastrophic events may be impending and therefore there's a kind of moral responsibility to put one's ego second and put one's political responsibility first to hesitantly make some predictions uh, because, as I said, if what I see coming turns out to be correct, then we have a lot of serious work ahead of us and we have to concentrate our energies and summon up our 
inner wherewithal to try to prevent what's now unfolding. Um, I'm going to begin with what happened in Gaza, then look at what happened on the Freedom Flotilla on the Mavi Marmara, and then look at what's called the peace process. Uh, even though I'm going to begin with Gaza, the story really begins in May 2000, when after a 17-year-long guerrilla war, the Israeli army was evicted from South Lebanon. Uh, Israel suffered a major defeat in South Lebanon and was determined to undo that retreat, or to use the Israeli language, to restore their deterrence capacity. And that's just a fancy technical term, and it just means to restore the Arab world's fear of Israel. Come July, August 2006, Israel found the pretext, the excuse, to go into Lebanon, and as I said, to try to undo the disaster that befell the Israeli army during those 17 years of occupation of Lebanon. Unpredictably, Israel suffered another defeat in 2006 during the July-August war. And now Israel was more determined than ever to undo its defeats and restore the Arab world's fear of it. It then invaded Gaza in 2008-2009, not to stop the rocket attacks from rocket and mortar attacks on Israel, because there had been a ceasefire in place, and if Israel didn't want those rocket and mortar attacks, all it had to do was abide by the ceasefire. The main purpose of that attack on Gaza in 2008-9, its main purpose was to restore the Arab world's fear of it by wreaking havoc, death, and destruction on the people of Gaza. What happened in Gaza had nothing whatsoever to do with the people of Gaza or the government of Gaza, but it had everything to do, as Israelis were happy to admit, it had everything to do with the defeat they suffered in 2006 in Lebanon. Now, they did, see, they did inflict massive death and destruction in, the, in Gaza, but still it didn't really restore the Arab world's fear of it, because everybody knew that Hamas was not a significant fighting force. So it was not so much that what Israel did impress the Arab world and Muslim world, as it was that it filled the Arab Muslim world and the international community with sheer disgust at the magnitude of the cowardice. Israel then launched several commando raids, one in Dubai, and then the more famous one, or notorious one, on the Mahdi Marmara of the Freedom Flotilla, and even those operations were bungled. And now Israel has, or has, a real problem on its hands. How do you restore the outer world's quote-unquote respect for you and your military power after such a succession of defeats and bungled operations? And as it looks now, the way Israel intends to do it, and I'll get there towards the end of my remarks, as it looks now, the way Israel intends to do it 
to launch a massive assault on Lebanon, comparable to what it did in Gaza in 2008-9. Uh, leaving aside for the moment the magnitude of destruction which will almost certainly be inflicted on Lebanon, there's a, third, there's a second issue which is at least as important as the first, that that's a war that will be easy to start, but very hard to end, uh, for reasons which I will get to. In any case, that's the broad overview of what I'll be discussing this evening. So let me begin with Gaza, bearing in mind that Gaza is not the beginning, it's, you would say, one third of the way after the beginning. The story of Gaza basically begins in January 2006, when there were parliamentary elections among the Palestinians in the occupied territories, elections which Jimmy Carter called completely honest and fair. He was one of the observers. Unexpectedly, the Islamic movement Hamas emerged victorious in these completely honest and fair elections. The immediate reaction of Israel and the United States was to impose economic sanctions on Hamas. Around June 2007, a year and a half later, the United States, together with Israel and some elements of the Palestinian Authority, they attempted a coup against the legally elected government. The coup failed. Hamas dispatched the Palestinian elements to the West Bank. And now Israel and the United States deepened or tightened the blockade of Gaza. Amnesty International said the blockade is a flagrant violation of international law. The UN mandated Goldstone mission later said the blockade is a possible crime against humanity. The former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Mary Robinson, she journeyed to Gaza around this time, and she said Gaza's whole civilization has been destroyed. I'm not exaggerating. Its whole civilization has been destroyed. In June 2008, Gaza, or Hamas in Israel, entered into a ceasefire. And under the terms of the ceasefire, which was brokered by Egypt, each side had obligations. On the Palestinian side, Hamas had to stop its rocket and mortar attacks on Israel. And on the Israeli side, the Israelis had to gradually lift the blockade of Gaza. The, the blockade, which was a flagrant violation of international law, the blockade which was destroying the civilization. Well, according to the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and now I quote them, they say Hamas was careful to maintain the ceasefire. Hamas was careful to maintain the ceasefire. But Israel reneged on its obligation to gradually lift the blockade of Gaza. So as of this point, Hamas fulfilled its obligations. Israel reneged on its obligations. What happened next? What happened next is not a matter of controversy. All you have to do is turn to Amnesty International's yearbook for 2009, and they say as follows. A ceasefire agreed in June between Israel and Palestinian armed groups in Gaza and held for four and a half months. But it broke down after Israeli forces killed 
6,000 Syrian militants and airstrikes.